Wow, pretty bad idea, huh? Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm going to talk about three things in my speech. First of all, I'm going to talk about why this is unnecessary, why the things that we're doing at the moment are pretty good at getting rid of ISIS, why we think that actually ISIS is probably going to fall apart, apart amongst, its, amongst itself at the point where it doesn't have any funding, at the point where there's no real reason to foresee its continued existence as a meaningful entity with the things that we're doing. Second of all, I'm going to talk about why their policy makes um, lives for Iraqis massively worse in the short term. Second of all, I'm going to talk about why their policy, should it work, makes lives massively worse in the long term, including talking about the partition. One extraneous point of rebuttal as I go, because the Oxford case relies on the idea that the status quo is crippling Sunni Shia relationships and the, so an invasion is going to sort that out, right? But the problem is, right, that when an American invasion happens, America is seen as a predominantly Shia actor. Why do we know this? Because the recent invasion of Iraq by America led to a situation where you had a government which led to policies which massively improved the lives of Shias and disinfected franchise Sunnies. We just don't see it as true, as likely, that when the Americans come in, Sunnies are going to believe that they're going to get a fair deal out of this partition, they're going to get any meaningful control of important resources like oil and water, or any meaningful access to economic benefits for their lives. That's going to be important, and that's why they're going to lose this debate. Right, so, why do we think that this is unnecessary? So, the first thing, like, we've got quite a lot of them not being able to defend themselves from the ISIS onslaught at the moment, right? First of all, we point out, as I openly do, that's patently not true, they made one strategic retreat and then came back, but we think that there are serious reasons to suppose why ISIS are likely to implode. First off, they have no obvious leader, they have no obvious ideology, there are serious reasons why they are likely to start arguing at the point at which they get larger and take more power, right? We th also yeah. think that Sorry. funding of Kurdish and Iraqi forces, which by the way aren't ethnically divided, right, the, uh, the Iraqi army is entirely Shia, right, means that trained forces can overcome a force which whilst like a bit large and evil is untrained and ill-equipped, right? Notice that opening up very sensibly said that we're not looking to conquer ISIS, right? They will just destroy themselves. How do we know this? Because nobody in the Middle East wants to fund them. There isn't a single mm, Middle East that. actor for whom it's in the rational self-interest to give money to a really unstable, evil organisation controlling swathes of the Middle East. It would absolutely destroy the region. But then they say that, like, um, the status quo just doesn't work because power sharing doesn't work. We say, first of all, neither does part I'm going to come on to that later. But second of all, all they showed was that bad power sharing doesn't work, right? That's why the new Prime Minister, Al Haida, is setting up an efficient power sharing agreement which actually has Sunnis in the government. We'd quite like to give that a go because we think that all the reasons why ISIS set up and start fighting are unlikely to be the case under that scenario. Right, why does it make lives for Iraqis worse in the short term? The first thing, they mention a lot about atrocities, right? Look. At the point at which the Americans come in, we think ISIS are going to try desperately to try and get them out. We think that at that point, if they're as evil as they say, they are massively incentivized to commit far more atrocities and far more atrocities, far more crucifixions to try and scare the Americans off. They're likely to use tactics like human shields. Why do we think that those tactics are likely to be more effective? Because of the way that America chooses to fight wars, Mr. Speaker, it has a huge political incentive to minimize the loss of lives of its own citizens at the cost of collateral damage to Iraqi civilians. It tends to use a lot of air attacks, a lot of destruction of infrastructure, so that one American can die instead of ten at the cost of a couple of hundred Iraqis in an unfortunate series of events. That's one reason why it improves the ISIS recruitment drive. But why are there other reasons why it's likely to improve the ISIS recruitment drive and make the problem much, much worse? We would point out that, number one, it is mainly operating in sunny areas of Iraq at the moment, and second of all, that America is seen in these regions as hugely pro-Shia, as I pointed out, because the most recent invasion of Iraq led to the Sunni-dominated government. We say it's very unlikely that Sunnis on the ground are going to believe that they will get a fair deal, and the Sunni militias who are currently only deciding that they're going to attempt to defend their own communities are likely to defect to ISIS because they're going to see that if the Americans win and you have this yeah, partition, okay. their lives are going to get massively worse. Thirdly, we say at the point at which the Americans come in and overtake like, the Iraqi state's attempt to fight off um, ISIS, you lose the faith in the Iraqi state's ability to fight them and you cripple the trust in the new government of Baghdad. We say that's incredibly problematic given how fragile it is currently. Fourthly, we say that it just makes guerrilla war more, more likely, guerrilla war more likely given what I previously said, because it means that ISIS ISIS become the popular actor, right? People will now allow them to hide in their homes, People, exactly like we saw with the Viet Cong and Vietnam. Compare this to a situation where we can arm reasonably efficient units to overcome ISIS in a way which is unlikely to be as divisive. We think we massively win in the short term on that front. No thanks, Molina. 
Why do we think that we make it worse in the long term? So we think that this is going to be a prolonged invasion, right? The threat from ISIS is not going to go away just as soon as you take land. You need to be able to control that land. They're not even trying to control that land, by the way, because they said that they demilitarize everywhere. Like, when you demilitarize everywhere, all the ISIS people who've just crossed the border into Syria are just going to come back and take all the stuff. That was really, really stupid, guys. Um, we, uh, exactly like the Viet Cong did in Vietnam, right? They just go to the safe place and they hide, right? Unless they're proposing that the Americans are going to chase them across the Syrian border or try and hold the Syrian border, we just don't see why they've given an explanation as to why that won't happen. That means that you need sustained political capital in order to be able to stay, which we think is very unlikely, right? The response that we got to this was, oh, but we're better at war now, so it's not going to take ages. We think that claim probably needs some analysis, right? We think that Obama came under huge amounts of pressure to withdraw from Iraq when Americans kept dying there, even though infrastructure hadn't been rebuilt, security of the North was long non-existent, see the existence of ISIS now, and guerrilla war was continuing. All of these problems mean that America are likely to pull out far too early, leading to instability before Iraq has a chance to recover. The partition, right? And this is the interesting bit. So sunny Iraq has huge problems, right? The fact that it doesn't adjoin a coast, so it's dependent on the, south, the southern part of Iraq, allowing it to be able to transport resources from the coast to it. We say that given the divisions that they say exist, it's very incredibly likely that they're going to get blockades and have massive economic uh, poverty, right? We also say that their water and oil sharing plans don't work, like they are currently not working in South Sudan because breaking the uh, agreements is incentivized because the threat not to, the threat from America that they will go in is an empty on, right? Th third of all, we say that the sunny state is likely to be end up being run by military leaders, right? Because their culture is defined on violence against them from Shias, because all leaders of local communities are the ones with guns who control the people with the guns. And that's massively problematic, because even if you don't get, Mr. Speaker, uh, cross-border conflicts between non-state actors, which we say you do, because we say it's likely to be incredibly unpopular and people are going to want to keep fighting, you're going to have political incentives to have war between those states. This is just a really bad idea.